various demons uh, running there as root, such as uh, including SSHD. And so uh, if I was to really uh, restrict root access, that would cause some problems with other things. And so it's easy just to uh, restart it occasionally. Uh, one thing we recommend, of course, is uh, that people, that general people don't do this. Don't allow uh, untrusted processes to run a, a, as root. Uh, it's best to have defense in depth, have multiple level security, so you have Unix permissions and easy Linux access controls as two layers of defense. But the purpose of the play machine is to test the easy Linux layer to make sure that all works uh, in a desired manner. And we've had, made a number of improvements to easy Linux over the years uh, based on uh, people being able to do things on the play machine that uh, I didn't desire them to, and then fixing the policies that they couldn't. Incidentally, it would be uh, interesting if someone was to, say, uh, run a, a play machine with this uh, rootless uh, Linux system uh, relying on the, on the capabilities. Yes? So my, my actual intention had been to demo such a system here, but um, life got in the way. Uh, so maybe we'll see about that next year. The rootless system is a bit of a conundrum in that it really does require a good, good amount of application change. It really does require a distribution level attention. Uh, as the SC Linux people have become well aware, uh, so if it weren't for Fedora, SC Linux would probably be nowhere near where it is today. I think that's fairly safe. Well, there you go. Okay. Well, I got I got one other thing I want to want to ask you. Okay. Uh, when when we finished up this, uh, could you give us an overview of what's new in SE Linux over the past year? Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll give it the mic to him, and he'll. We'll, 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 one of us will do it at the end. Okay. Yeah, so back to distribution level attention. I mean, I've been working uh, on uh, Debian SE Linux for the last um, uh, oh, eight years or so, uh, apart from the time I was employed by Red Hat, which I was mostly working on Fedora. So uh, if, I, if Red Hat hadn't been doing it, we would still been doing uh, SE Linux and Debian. Uh, progress wouldn't have been as good with, with less main power, but it would still be happening. Uh, so I, I don't think that uh, SE Linux is uh, relying on uh, Red Hat support, the way some other managed access control systems are relying on a, on a single uh, Linux vendor, for example. Okay, but back to uh, uh, Play Machine. Now, uh, uh, one thing that, that I've been planning to release for a while, but it has been uh, delayed due to a, sort of, well, life getting in the way, as you might say, is uh, to run a, uh, a Zen server for, for REST Linux training. So uh, hopefully very soon I'll, I'll have, uh, hopefully next week or the latest, I'll have this uh, up and running, and I'll be able to uh, grant access to, to a uh, DOMU for anyone who wants to learn about SE Linux. So grant someone access for a day or two, and they can then uh, it's, uh, have it start off with a machine running, a DOMU running Debian without SE Linux. They can enable SE Linux, configure it, and run through a, a, a set uh, training schedule. Uh, complete a number of tasks to learn about uh, different things, and uh, uh, at the end of that, know um, how to perform all basic tasks of, of SE Linux administration and operation. It's a, a training thing I've run many times in the past uh, in an in-person uh, uh, basis. So I've had uh, you know, labs full of computers and have people each sitting around like a computer that I've installed. But I want to do it uh, over the net uh, via Zen so that anyone anywhere in the world can do it. And of course the next step after that is to then make the original image available for download and so that anyone in the world can uh, download it and not have to wait in a queue for the uh, say four or five different DOM U's that are available. Uh, my obstacle in that regard at the moment has been the fact that uh, there's a, a bug in BitTorrent and BitTorrent won't actually serve my files. So if anyone's an expert in BitTorrent, please uh, advise me on this after my talk. Now, after Lenny, um, I, I gave a talk yesterday about uh, Kai uh, Kohai's uh, great work in uh, adding SC Linux access controls to the PostgreSQL database. So one thing I want to do is to get this in Debian uh, as soon as possible, basically. So obviously, uh, that's not going to go into to, to, uh, uh, Lenny main release. 
but uh, uh, so I plan to uh, build my own package uh, for learning my own repository with this Linux support, and uh, which will also probably involve uh, putting some policy in there as well. I think the policy we've currently got in Lenny uh, doesn't have the, the PostgreSQL support that we need. But that's a, a minor thing. And uh, then uh, the issue is how to support for Lenny plus one. So uh, uh, I'll initially have my own uh, repository for this. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get the uh, uh, changes included in the uh, main PostgreSQL package and uh, have available for everyone to use. But that will be a bit more work. Uh, so if we use time, we'll uh, have results for that. And uh, another uh, thing that uh, we're hoping for, for the next version of Debian is uh, the XX controls, also known as Security Enhanced X. Uh, one problem that uh, is often uh, not addressed in terms of, of uh, X controls is X windows. Uh, if you have two windows on the same desktop, they can interfere with each other in uh, many different ways. And uh, in most cases, uh, X control systems do nothing about this. Uh, with, uh, we have uh, very little in the way of support for uh, restricting access at all to, to X systems. To do this properly, we need to have uh, controls on, on all uh, window messages that are being sent. So you, you can't send a, a message to, a, to another window uh, in an appropriate manner. And also, the clipboard manager needs to, to be aware of SE Linux and support uh, labeling of clipboard data. So if you, uh, you have a clipboard manager with a dozen different uh, objects in it, only the, the uh, objects that are uh, appropriate for a, a program can be sent to it. And of course, also, I think we would need, need to have a support for relabeling. So in situations where the user can relabel data, they should be able to relabel data in the clipboard and uh, then paste it in. And this will prevent attacks such as, uh, well, the common problem you'll see if you're on IRC. Someone just uh, suddenly, for no apparent reason, types in uh, eight semi-random characters on a single line in their, their IRC session. And you just know they were trying to paste a password and click the wrong window and pa paste into IRC instead of their uh, uh, terminal session. You don't know what the password was to, but you know it's something that they have access to. And if you know them well enough to know what machines they're logging to, you probably guess uh, where to use it. So the idea is that when they do a copy and paste password thing, which isn't entirely unreasonable, uh, then uh, they can only paste it into a session that has the, the right uh, label, and not a session with, uh, dealing with untrusted hostile data to an IRC client. Of course, another thing is um, IRC clients themselves have had a, a long and poor security history. Uh, it seems that every IRC client will have regular security problems, and uh, it would be good if you had an, an X Windows based IRC client that has all the nice features of uh, colorizing text, having multiple windows, etc but which couldn't own you entirely if it got broken or when it gets broken. Uh, in a typical environment, you, you have uh, an X windows based IRC client running the same desktop as your uh, mail user agent, and uh, if the, the IRC client gets broken, you can read your mail and do other bad things, which isn't desired. And with SE Linux controls, we can uh, stop this. So I think that I'm not sure that uh, we'll get this Security Enhanced X in uh, Lenny Plus One, this is a lot of work and a lot of testing. And uh, also, it has a, a, a lot of potential for breaking things. This doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that there's a lot of work to get this right. And there are a lot of programs doing a lot of unexpected things. If you were to, for example, try SSH minus X versus SSH minus Y to log into machines, you notice that uh, even if with, with the um, slight reduction in privileges uh, through the SSH uh, client, many programs get very unhappy and give you warning messages and uh, sometimes even break. Uh, with uh, XX controls with SE Linux, there'll be uh, greater isolation and therefore greater unhappiness through some of these programs that are written to expect it. Uh, these bugs are going to be fixed, but it'll take some time. So uh, possibly XX, uh, XX control will be Lenny plus two, even. OK, I, I think I've covered most of the, the status of SE Linux in Lebian, Lenny and Lenny plus one. Uh, I'll take some questions and then mention some other things uh, slightly related. So, questions right now? No questions at all. Yes? Uh, that's a good question. The question is uh, what's the level of uh, collaboration between uh, Fedora and Debian? Uh, the way it works, uh, it's been working over the last uh, couple of years, is uh, the Fedora people develop the policy, they send it upstream. And uh, then it goes into the, the uh, NSA policy tree, that, or sorry, it's the Tresis tree now. When they do a release, then uh, I take it and put it into Debian. As well as that, uh, that when they send their patches to the list, if there's a patch that seems particularly uh, necessary, then I'll take it in before that. 
but usually I just take it from the, the Tresis tree. Uh, the uh, Fedora people are doing a, a very great rate of, of policy change, so uh, trying to uh, juggle all these patches is a time-consuming task. And so in most cases, I'll just uh, take the, the Tresis tree and uh, not try and uh, adopt all, all the patches. The answer to this is that um, there are some things that perhaps uh, will be a little harder to work in Debian than, than uh, in Fedora. Uh, I'm having some problems currently with uh, KDE, which I suspect might not be a problem with uh, Fedora. But it's a matter of uh, time to juggle patches. Uh, James, you want to come in? Okay, the question is, um, have I looked at putting chaos mode into Debian? Uh, chaos mode is a way of uh, greatly restricting a, 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 the access of one particular a, a account. So they can have a, what's called a chaos mode. So you log into a guest, as guests on the machine and uh, can't mess things up in various ways. And it's a great feature. Uh, I've uh, read about it. Uh, it sounds good. Uh, it's a matter of uh, time. So uh, you, thanks for the prompting. Uh, I'll, I'll make it a little bit higher on my, my uh, priority list than it was before. Uh, it's a good thing to have. But it's a matter of uh, having time to, to work on it. Uh, most of my time has been spent on, on uh, the server side of SE Linux, uh, which means I've had less time for the desktop than I, I would otherwise had. And also, one thing that, that I have to admit is that um, kiosk mode isn't something I've had to use for myself uh, of recent times. So uh, things that I actually use myself uh, get a higher priority for obvious reasons. Um, the uh, SE Linux team in Debian isn't as large as I would like. Uh, it's currently uh, me on, and uh, Menog. Uh, if we get some more people, more Debian developers to join the team, then we can have more time to uh, work on some of these things. But it's a good feature. I'd like to get it. Uh, it won't be in uh, Lenny. That's one thing that, that you can be sure of. Uh, it's, it's too late to make any major changes like that. But uh, my, having my own repository, having a modified policy which includes this, uh, at least in six months' time, that's something that's uh, a definite possibility. Okay, more, more questions? Okay, yep. Um, actually, one of my friends has, has done this. Um, question is, is it possible to, to use uh, OpenSUSE with SE Linux? Uh, one of my friends, Paul Dwayhouse, uh, did some work in the past in, in that, and he had uh, packages built. Uh, also, uh, of recent times, uh, SUSE have, have changed their policy in terms of, of building packages, and I believe they're now shipping some packages with SE Linux support. This doesn't mean you, you can just use SUSE and, and enable it, but it means that if you use SUSE and you want to get some extra packages then from somewhere else, uh, the number of packages you have to change is much greatly reduced. So instead of changing, uh, you know, eight packages to change four or something. Uh, I haven't checked it in detail, but I'll just read the announcement, and the announcement means that it will save some time. So it's, it's definitely possible. Uh, and even before uh, Susie did that, uh, my friend Paul had uh, got this uh, working with him all through his own packages. Uh, he just gave up due to uh, other issues taking his time, and also uh, an apparent lack of interest. Uh, there didn't seem to be much of a... a, a um, Susie community wanting to use these packages, which uh, I think uh, decreases interest in, in making them. So if, if Susie people were to rush out there and want to start using SE Linux, then I think Paul might be inclined to um, do some more work on it. Any more questions? Okay, now, um, in terms of... Well, that, that, okay. In, in terms of, of uh, uh, SE Linux training, uh, who here would be interested in, in using a, a DOM U to learn about SE Linux? Okay, good, about five people. Okay, so, so what I'm going to try and do is get it going this week and uh, announce it to the LCA chat mailing list if I, if I get it in, done in time, which will depend on uh, how much net access I get, how much time I have, etc. Uh, so it's not certain, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and get it done. And then if so, I, I can give you accounts and uh, you can go through the, the training uh, course. Okay? Uh, thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Russell. Somebody had actually uh, expressed interest in having a, doing a lightning talk earlier. If you're in the audience and you were thinking about doing a lightning talk, I have, we have a few minutes now. Come on down. Touchy.
it's always always great when you can see somebody writing a device driver for the the display as we as they go. There we go. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, James Morris. I'm one of the SC Linux developers, and I thought uh, actually I, was, I wasn't sure if I was going to be here, so I didn't uh, put anything in for the uh, mini conf, but. Um, I was asked if I could do a, an update on uh, the SC Linux project a few minutes ago. I don't actually have anything prepared, but um, I thought what I might try and do is demonstrate uh, Chaos Mode, which is like a, uh, an example of uh, SC Linux being applied to solve a general uh, user uh, scenario without requiring you know, knowledge of uh, you know, SC Linux policy and having to deal with complexity, it's sort of abstracted away. So I'll just see if it'll work, if I, if I can log out. Oops. Okay, so uh, this is Fedora 10, and this is a, a feature that's been here in Fedora since about Fedora 8, and shipping uh, available uh, since Fedora 9 as a, as a new install. Uh, so uh, this system has got SE Linux running and uh, enforcing mode, and what we have is uh, an account called Guest, which has no password, and you, it just logs you in. And this is this uh, chaos mode that I've mentioned. So what it is, it's basically an anonymous uh, desktop session. And that's why there's no password. And I'll just have to plug in a mouse. Probably useful to have a mouse pad as well. OK, so. What happens here is basically you get this anonymous session and whatever you do uh, here will disappear after the session. So you can create notes. Um, so this would be useful uh, in a a library or anywhere that you have um, yeah, need to give access to people, uh, trade shows, email gardens, uh, product demonstrations, and so on. Optical mouse doesn't work too well here. So you can see uh, if someone's basically, I'm simulating someone coming in and vandalizing uh, the system.
Okay. Another interesting thing here is that uh, this user can only see its own processes. So you can only see uh, X guest if you... And to get this working, if you've got Fedora, a recent version of Fedora, you just need to type yum install X guest. It's a package and you log out and log back in and the, the guest account's there. So there's no, it's literally zero configuration. So here this, is, this user can only see this. And another thing is that um, the limited access to the file system. So once this session is uh, over, oops. So this is uh, logging back in and yeah, as you can see basically the desktop is back to where it was and there's no, there's no notes there. Um, home directory is back. And you can see these uh, bookmarks are back again probably try and get the internet up. Okay, so what's going on with this is, uh, this is uh, basically a combination of uh, different technologies that are available in uh, both Linux and also with uh, SE Linux. And these are being combined in a way that uh, weren't necessarily uh, envisaged when these features were first put in. So one of the first things to notice here is that uh, this user session, this guest user session, the reason that everything came back was because uh, it's using something called uh, Linux namespaces to set up the home directory uh, for the user. So this is an idea, namespaces, file system namespaces are an idea that came from uh, Plan 9 and they were integrated into Linux I think in like 2001 by Al Vero who's a, a big Plan 9 fan and weren't really used that much until um, the certification effort for SE Linux to get SE Linux certifiable for use with classified information. And the traditional uh, trusted operating systems have this uh, requirement that uh, if you have a directory, a shared directory that can have uh, you know, uh, information at uh, different uh, security levels like uh, secret or top secret, then users cleared at different uh, security with different security clearances should only should not uh, be able to see objects uh, which are uh, classified at a different level and they should uh, also be able to for example create a file that they can't see that's there that's at a different classification level and this has got a few names it's called uh, polyinstantiated directories it's called multi-level directories so it's kind of the same uh, thing it's been implemented a few times so this is a problem because uh, Linux didn't have this kind of thing available in the kernel. And Linux is not a really good place to go hacking these kinds of things in, unlike proprietary uh, operating systems where uh, they, they were able to get away with a lot of things. So one of the uh, solutions that came along was to use uh, Linux namespaces so that you could actually have private uh, temporary directories and, and, or any directory uh, using a private view of, of the file system, which is specific to the user. And uh, so this basically was uh, used to solve the certi those certification uh, problems. And it turned out that this is also useful generally for the general users where you have a lot of classic um, vulnerabilities come from, um, you know, temp races and various things. Well, if you use uh, Linux namespaces, then everyone gets their own uh, temporary directory. And the integration, so this, this functionality was actually in the kernel, but uh, where the, I guess the uh, breakthrough was made was in the usability and it was integrated into uh, PAM. So um, there's a PAM module uh, called PAM underscore namespace, which when you're actually logging in uh, to this uh, guest X session, uh, it actually sets up the namespaces and there's some configuration files for um, slash temp and I think var temp. It also uses it for slash home. So for, for the X guest 
um, you've got like a, a private directory, but another thing that's being used here is that the home directory is actually being set up as a tempfs uh, directory. So I'm not sure how much will be available to see here. Keep moving things around in the menus with every Fedora release. It's, it's great. So if you look down the bottom there, if you can read that, is that readable? You can see on the, uh, the bottom the, the mounts, uh, you can see that um, temp, the var temp and uh, home ex guest are uh, tempfs. So this is just a RAM based file system uh, which is only visible to the logged in user. So if you actually uh, go in and, and to a console, console or come in through SSH into the system, even root won't be able to see uh, these, these directories. And one of the good things about this is that what PAM also does is, um, and how PAM is being utilised here, and this is the pluggable authentication modules, which is originally from Sun, I believe. Um, and I guess just a, a brief introduction to PAM, five second introduction. It's, a, it's a, an API that applications uh, have been using now for quite some time. Um, but before PAM came along, there was uh, no standard way to, for applications to call out to different types of author authentication systems. And uh, often, if you looked at older versions of applications, they would be have all these if defs and, and patches to deal with. You know, do, do we have Kerberos or are we using shadow passwords? And now, uh, you this is all um, shoved out into a PAM library, and the applications just call that. And then the system administrator uh, configures uh, PAM to determine how, you know, whether you, which applications use which types of authentication. So that's what's happening here is we're just saying that uh, when, uh, when you log in uh, to this particular account um, that these directories are set up. And when, when this user logs out and this session ends, um, all of this disappears because it's RAM based and, and there's, no, uh, there's no permanent state. And it's actually not possible to, to, for, from here to actually leave any kind of uh, state behind once you uh, log out. And that's important, particularly for kiosk mode applications where you might have people uh, coming along and using their internet banking at the airport, uh, which is kind of stupid. I, I wouldn't recommend that under any circumstances, but uh, people uh, uh, probably want to do these kinds of things uh, in any case. And uh, with this, this addresses the issue of somebody leaving some malware sitting there like a keystroke logger or so on. Uh, everything that, um, so when you log out, PAM actually kills off everything that the user was running. So if you, even if you try and run applications hidden in the background and so on, they all get killed. Um, PAM also makes sure that only one um, ex-guest uh, session is running at a time because you could get some problems there. It also makes sure that uh, you can only log in through uh, GDM. You can't SSH into this account. Um, and what's also happening here, which is a, a little bit unusual uh, and a different way of thinking about mandatory access control, it's actually protecting um, the system from the user. So normally what you're trying to achieve with security, particularly on the internet, is that you're looking at the system being protected from uh, external threats, uh, which is how SE Linux was initially um, configured in Fedora, and that's, it still is. And that's a, a useful goal. But this is an example of protecting the system from the user. You're, you're assuming a potentially hostile user uh, on the system. So uh, SE Linux policy is being uh, used to limit um, what this ex-guest account can do. So it can run, it can access the, the network through just the uh, web ports and through DNS and only through certain applications. So uh, Firefox works but I think you'll find that turning to port 80 um, doesn't work. Okay, so this is uh, part, just part of the way SE Linux works, that it can actually bind um, users to specific applications. 
so it'll say yes you can access the internet through the web browser and then they lock down the web browser and uh, it also at another level enforces what that application can do so there's this um, I guess this three-way binding uh, so I guess this is a, an example of a high-level abstraction you don't administrators don't need to know anything about uh, SE Linux or even any don't need specialized security knowledge at all and you just install it and run it and this is part of how SE Linux was envisaged that after like all the initial uh, work going into the integration into the system that we'd be developing these kinds of high-level applications and on Friday I'm giving a, a talk on uh, how we're doing something similar with virtualization trying to have a, basically a, a zero or low low configuration simple uh, application of, of mandatory access control to uh, virtualization So there is, it is possible to do some configuration at a high level with some uh, high level tools. Child. How many characters is my password? Yeah, I don't remember that. So there are some high level uh, SE Linux management tools. And uh, this is a bit of also an update on some of the things that have been going on in SE Linux in the last year or so. Um, there's been a lot of work going into these kinds of uh, high-level tools for, for managing different things. And this is the um, SE Linux administration tool. And actually, the, I gave a talk at OLS uh, about six months ago and did an up update on the project, um, the overall project, which is basically current as of six months ago. So if you Google for have you driven an SE Linux lately? You'll get a PDF, a paper, quite a lengthy uh, full paper on, on everything that's basically happened in the project and all of the, the current work. And, and uh, these kinds of things are explained in, in detail, uh, what's going on here uh, underneath. Uh, so this is your basically administration console. And these are the on the front page of the, the higher level uh, aspects of the system as to whether it's uh, in enforcing mode and um, what type of policy you have running. Um, and these are the, so what, what happens um, is that people often want to try and do different things uh, with uh, their system. And the model with SE Linux is that the policy generally supplied with the system. But often you'll find that there are patterns to different things that people want to do, such as if you're running an FTP server, whether you want to allow uh, anonymous only access to a specific directory or whether you want to allow people to access their home directories through FTP. And this is, uh, this, these kinds of patterns are sort of recognised by the SE Linux developers after a while and they um, have developed a, a mechanism called Booleans where you can just switch this type of coarse high level behaviour on or off. Uh, you know, do you want something to happen or not? So here's one here. Do you want your web server to be able to send email or not? And this is just simply a, a pre-packaged um, policy module which, uh, or, or policy component which is enabled or disabled dynamically. So uh, if you switch this on, then uh, if there's a vulnerability in uh, Apache, then uh, you can allow yourself to be turned into a spam relay or a spam server. So this is the kind of thing that we probably want to have disabled by default but still allow uh, users. because there are lots of legitimate uh, uses for, for web servers sending email like you know forms and and all kinds of things so this is the kind of uh, abstraction that we hope that most uh, admins uh, deal with and I'll just so there's several relating to uh, XGuest 
And for example, there's, a, there's one here, um, allow ex guest exec content. And unfortunately, these aren't documented particularly well. And most people don't even know this stuff exists. And then if you did find it, it's like, what does it do? So documentation is a problem. We've actually got a, a, a full-time document writer now on the SE Linux project for the first time in six years or seven years. So we're rapidly sort of catching up here. But this is a, a thing where uh, most of the time you wouldn't want to allow an ex-guest kiosk mode user to um, compile and execute code that they, let's say, you know, you can go into their, they can go into their temp directory and uh, edit a, a C file and, and write some code. You def usually don't want that to happen. And we found there was an, exa an interesting example where somebody was running um, open office from the kiosk mode account and was getting uh, these SE Linux alerts popping up, which is another Another thing I don't think any have popped up, but if, uh, now when you get a, a policy violation under Fedora, a little box will pop up and you can click on it. It gives you lots of information. You can submit bug reports. It, it even sometimes tries to tell you how to solve the problem and it's sometimes correct. Um, but that's helped in terms of giving users sort of visibility into what's going on um, instead of being a sort of black box that's just stopping things and not even knowing that it's stopping it. At least you now know, oh, that was SE Linux and uh, here's maybe a way to fix it. So what happened was this person was using uh, XGuess and they were using OpenOffice and they got this um, error message came up when they downloaded a spreadsheet, I think it was, saying um, this, you know, this, this operation was denied. And so after looking through the logs that uh, were, were generated by this SE alert facility, it uh, was determined that what was happening was that OpenOffice was actually compiling C code. There was a macro, and I think what, I don't know exactly what it was doing, but it looked like it was compiling C code in the temporary directory, then executing it and feeding the results back in through the spreadsheet. So, <laughs> well, well, this is a bit unexpected. And so I said, oh, that's really good. You know, SE Linux just, just did what it's supposed to be doing. And then the uh, person wrote back and said, no, I actually want this to work. I, this, I, this is a feature I want. So as usual, you, you can never sort of predict what people actually want. And, and so there's, there's a boolean here which you can flip that. And if you do that, you could, you could go back in and show that it was now allowing you to execute. And also, um, there, there's other things. Um, there's a, you know, the ability to use network manager. Basically, that means can you click on the network manager icon and get onto the network? Yes or no. Um, removable devices. Uh, this can be a problem. One of the things with um, that next guest session, there was a way actually to to subvert the next session there, which is to leave a um, a thumb drive, a USB drive stuck in there with something on there that um, is is unpleasant. And if the next user comes along, they might be able to mount that and double click on it and do some damage to themselves. Uh, so that. Yeah, removable media and, and, and so on is, is definitely something that uh, is a vector for, for malware and that can be controlled at this level. Uh, so there's, there's quite a lot there in this. Um, there's even a, a wizard in here to create new policy, which, yep, it's working. So there's a, like a guided... Um, interface here. And this, this again is something that's been developed in the last year or so as, as a new uh, SE Linux development. Now when, when I first started looking at this, only the applications uh, section was um, there. And since then we've now got uh, login users and root users. This is a, an extension of XGuest to a more general um, management of different types of users. So. Uh, there's also like a, a console-based guest account which uh, only allows text logins um, at a console. Very similar to XGuest, it just uh, doesn't allow uh, login through the uh, X system. <coughs> you might think, well, what? How could this be useful? And I've been to um, you know companies that are still using uh, terminal-based applications, and they will actually using Telnet um, back to. Um, back to mainframe systems and they'll have, you know, order placing systems. So someone rings up, does a, a phone order over the phone and the, the person is actually sitting there at a, in a telnet session. So this kind of thing having, um, confining those users to only be able to do those things on, on the system can potentially be useful. And then also what's uh, useful, what's interesting over here, um, 
for sort of more advanced users is having um, limited admin users. So you can actually start defining um, administrative administrative users who can do actually I don't actually know how this works. I haven't used it before. Uh, but the idea, and I've, I've read about this, I haven't actually tried it, but the idea is that you can uh, set up a, um, a root user, UID 0, that actually uses SE Linux to clamp down on, on what it can do. It's sort of a, a bit like, um, a little bit like capabilities with a, with a root user. Um, so it may be that uh, this user can uh, just manage um, storage for example, and, and there's, a, there's a wizard that is used to, to help you develop that. And no, this one, this one doesn't. Um, this one doesn't. It uses, it's, a, it's like a expert system, like a guided, um, Interface. I'll just I'll just set one up. So what it does, it, it's basically based on observations of um, existing applications. So you, you can start answering questions like which TCP ports. So here you can see these uh, types of questions being asked. And these are, these are common application traits. This is dbus, sends email. I mean, I don't know what, what application doesn't send email. It's not very good if it doesn't. And so that will actually generate loadable policy. So you can see there, it's, it's created these things. We, another, another development is the idea that you can actually have uh, loadable policy modules which um, allow policy to be shipped with applications. It also allows the uh, policy to be dynamically reconfigured. And uh, previously, policy, SE Linux policy was this huge monolithic um, single policy that you had to check out of CVS and go and hand edit and so on. It was just a nightmare. So. There's tools also that will, there is a kind of limited learning mode. There's something called um, audit to why. It's a command line tool which takes audit logs and will um, look at the policy violations, then generate a policy um, module which basically allows whatever was being denied. And so this is actually quite useful. I've, I've used it like I, when I was doing some development on SVIRT, I very quickly just needed to make some policy to, for testing purposes. And, and I, I forget all the syntax, but this, this will generate uh, the files for me uh, automatically. <coughs> Is this tool uh, only available with as, as far as I know, um, I think there's been some work going on in Ubuntu and OpenSUSE, but I don't know to what extent they've got these tools, but um, yeah, there's also there's actually several automatic policy generation systems. Um, there's also a project by uh, some Japanese developers called SE Edit, um, which is a project you could search for. Uh, S E E D I T, and its aim is basically to bring a kind of app armor configuration to SE Linux, and they have a, like a um, a higher level language which you develop in, and then it compiles down. And it it's a trade off. It, it it you lose some of the flexibility, but it you gain some usability. So this is a actually it's the same thing, just in a different place. Okay, so. I hope that was useful. Um.